My name is Nadia Lee Owens, and if you're new, welcome to Buy Back and Bookish, a booktube channel where a bi black girl who reads too much shows up nearly 10 years late to the Shadows and Bone fandom. And if you're not new, welcome back. I mentioned that I am reading the Shadow and Bone trilogy before in previous videos, but I feel I've fallen in a very typical pattern for myself where I get a little bored in the middle of a series and I hold off on reading uh, the next book. So I decided that I'll just make a shorter video for each book or at least have a separate video for this first one. I remember when the Netflix show was announced, it was trending on Tumblr with everyone freaking out. Meanwhile, I was super confused because I had zero clue what Shadow and Bone was even supposed to be. I all wasn't until my little cousin explained to me that it was a fantasy YA book that I even knew it was a book. And that was all I knew about Shadow and Bone until I actually read it. So beforehand, I wrote down predictions of what I thought Shadow and Bone was about. And I was very, very off. So I wrote that I was expecting a setting that is similar to Red London in the Shades of Magic series. I expected that the main female character would be an assassin but not any sort of assassin, but like a magical assassin uh, that'll give off very strong girl boss vibes. For some reason, I got into my head that this book was about assassins. I don't know what it was about the title, Shadow and Bone, but it made me think assassins. Um, and most importantly, uh, the female main character would be an orphan because all of these YA protagonists always are. Um, and this was pretty much the only thing I was worried about. For the main male character, I thought he would be her target, not necessarily royal, but from a very well-off family, something like a no woman. He would also be an asshole. This would be something I would also be somewhat right about. I predicted that they would have to go on some trip together where they would be running from the law or the shady organization that the female main character worked for because she was unable to kill the male character. Meanwhile, there would be a war starting to brew that only they would be able to stop and it would be caused by the villain who would be like an uncle to the main male character or something like that. If you know the Shadow and Bone plot, you are probably laughing at how wrong I was. If not, let me let you in on the joke. The prologue starts off with two orphan children, one boy and one girl, who live in the house of this duke who takes in orphan children from ransacked towns where they work and learn before they're tossed out back into the world. They are tested by these magic users that are called Grishas to see if either of them have any potential for magic, which neither of them seem to have. Uh, while the prologue and also the epilogue is in third person, the rest of the book is in first person, specifically the girl's point of view, whose name is Alina. At first, I found the change in POV a little jarring, mainly because I found this to be a tactic that new writers do a lot, even though I feel as if it doesn't contribute anything to the structure or enjoyment of the book or the plot at all. It could This could have easily been told in the same point of view as the rest of the book, preferably third person. Though I understand why a lot of YA is in first person, it is beneficial for a coming of age plot because we are kind of growing up along with them. It's just not my favorite uh, point, uh, point of view. It was once upon a time, but not anymore. Anyway, Alina and her childhood friend Mal are now in the army. Alina is an apprentice cartographer who describes herself pretty negatively. Uh, especially when it comes to her physical appearance. While Maul 
became a tracker, I think, and is, of course, seen as a very desirable young man. So it's pretty clear that Alina has romantic interest in Long, even if she isn't aware of that herself. They are preparing to cross the shadow fold, which is like this barrier of complete darkness that separates them from the coast and the rest of the world. And almost as soon as they enter the fold, everything goes to shit, which I appreciate because the book didn't keep me waiting long for the enticing action. The skiff that they are on get attacked by these winged humanoid creatures and all of Alina's photographer friends get murked almost instantly. And right when one of those creatures try to drag Maul away, a burst of light emits from Alina, which indicates her as a special type of Grisha called a Sun Summoner that apparently hasn't e existed for a really long time or maybe has never existed. A lot of them thought it was basically a myth. So Alina gets sent to the capital of Ulta by a man who is just called the Darkling no proper name given which is a huge red flag the darkling is the head of the grisha and is kind of an asshole so that's why i thought he would be another romantic interest to complete the obligatory ya love triangle when alina is in Oz alta she is introduced to the royal court at the palace and is boarded at the little palace and it's at this point that I notice that Alina doesn't have any sort of strong positive connection with another female character. Alina seemed to be threatened by the other female Greshas as the other female Greshas seem to be threatened by her. I guess it's because of her insecurities about her looks and maybe also how Alina kind of views other female characters I don't know what it is but uh like Alina seemed to be very obsessed about how she looked and how other people look especially when it comes to girls uh to the point where it did seem a bit sapphic but unfortunately it was just internal misogyny and low self-esteem Alina does end up becoming friends with another girl named Jinya a Gresha who is basically like a magical beautician. While at the little palace, Alina learns how to fight and use her powers, even though she can't really use it that well without the help of what is called an amplifier. Alina is constantly sending Maul letters that he never responds to, so she starts to worry that he may be dead. It was at this point that the plot started to feel somewhat stagnant, but then the plot became more fresh with the introduction of religious fantasism in this world when a priest guy called the Parrot, again, not a proper name given, so suspicious. Um, I kind of imagined uh, the Parrot looking somewhat like Ra Ra Rasputin, lover of the Russian queen. Um, and he tells her that she has basically become a saint, that the people of their country, Roska or Rava, are beginning to pray to. And like most saints, she will end up suffering, you know, borderline cultish stuff that I am a huge fan of. The Darkling tells Alina about a stag whose antlers can be used as a powerful amplifier. The Darkling and Alina also start to build up a potential romance. When Alina learns that Maul is alive and has just been apparently ignoring her letters, she begins to realize that the only reason why she blocked her own powers is because she wants to be able to come home to Maul. Once she comes to that realization, she starts to truly embrace her powers and through the embrace of her powers, she becomes more beautiful, more strong, blah, 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 blah. During a big party at the palace, the Gresha put on a big showing of their powers, 
with Alina Sun Sumner Powers at, as the grand finale. After the party, Alina comes across Maul, who happens to be a part of the team that has been tracking the stag. They get into a huge argument after Alina mentions the letters and Maul says he never got any letters. I, uh, I then started to realize the reason why a lot of people told me that the romance isn't the best in this book because it is kind of toxic. Like during the argument, Maul in a roundabout sort of way seems to slut shame her about how much she liked the attention she receives from the Darkling. And later in the book, Maul proves to be pretty possessive. The argument leaves Alina in tears and then to make the night even worse for this girl, she then learns that her other love interest is actually the guy who calls the shadow fold and is planning on using the stag's antlers in order to control her. But of course, the Darkling is evil. We never learn his name, his actual name, at least in this first book. Uh, whenever there is a character that hides their name, assume they are up to no good, like Rumpelstiltskin. So Alina runs away and while running away, she once again runs into Maul. Instead of turning her into the Darkling, Maul decides to help her in tracking down the stag so she can use the amplifier for herself rather than uh, for the Darkling. The two of them eventually mend their friendship and Maul even confesses to Alina. When they find the stag, Alina ultimately decides not to kill it and find another way to take down the Darkling. But just as she makes this decision, the Darkling and his men show up and they kill the stag and under the threat of killing Maul, Alina puts on the antlers around her neck, giving the Darkling full control over her. At the port to go through the shadow fold, the Darkling makes a threat towards every official and ambassador there by expanding the fold even further while Alina watches, unable to use her powers to stop it. But it wasn't until the Darkling overthrows Maul into the fold that Alina realizes that she has as much power over the stag as its savior as the Darkling has as its killer, and she uses her power to save Maul. Together, they run into the fold into the coast on the other side. In the epilogue, which is in the third person, like the prologue is, Maul and Alina are boarding a boat and leaving their home. Overall, I gave Shadow and Bone three stars out of five. As I've gotten older, I've noticed that there is an obsession with vanity and YA novels and the protagonists, usually girls, kind of tie their own self-worth to how conventionally attractive they are. And I'm not and I'm not implying that this only happens in YA books because this does happen in adult books as well. It's just especially prevalent to uh, YA. And I'm not saying that it is the reason for my lowest self-esteem as a teenager, but it was definitely a contributing factor. Uh, Shadow and Bone is no expectation to this trend. Like I mentioned before, Alina seemed very obsessed with how attractive everyone else was, especially other girls. Uh, Alina also didn't come across as an active main character. Most of the time, it's other people making choices for her and her kind of just going along with it. Like, her decision to run away wasn't even her own. It was the idea of an old lady who was teaching Alina and was also the Darkling's mother. Uh, the only decision she made on her own was not to kill the stag. Also, both love interests came across very toxic and possessive, and there ain't nothing cute about that. In the next books, I am hoping that Alina will become more independent and end in charge of her own story. I did watch 
the first episode of the Netflix show after reading the first book. And right off the bat, I did like Alina way more in the show rather than compared to book Alina. Show Alina was more of an active character. Like it was because of her own actions that she was sent to cross the shadow code. And I guess it's because we are not in her head like we are in the book. I didn't find her as self-deprecating and a little annoying as I did. Um, I also liked Maul in the show more than in the book because he seemed more like a sweet himbo rather than an asshole jock. Well, that's it. Let me know if you've read Shadow and Bone or if you watched the show or both and tell me what your opinions on those are in the comments below or talk to me on Twitter or Instagram at Amy Owens. Hope to see you next time when I do another read along video. This time I will be reading the short story, Welcome to Your Authentic Indian Experience to celebrate Native American Heritage Month. So be sure not to miss that by subscribing and um, until then, bye.